Facebook's so much bigger, it's 2 billion people. I'm like, yeah, it's 2 billion people, but like if you're advertising in the US, like how many people are in the US? Welcome everybody to another episode of Uncensored Direct Marketing. Today I have Chris Orzakowski. Chris is an expert in X or formerly known as Twitter ads, brand growth, email marketing. He's a copywriting expert. He's the founder of West Egg X Advertising. I still have a hard time, you know, calling X calling it X, you know, when uh, we were so used to Twitter, but yes, he's, he's working on the platform quite a bit. Uh, Chris has also uh, been dubbed as the 100 plus million dollar copywriter by Forbes. And he is one of the world's highest paid copywriters. Yes. So I know there's a lot of people out there that are doing copies. So you guys have to listen to Chris because uh, he makes the big bucks in this industry. So we can all learn a little something from him. So Chris, Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Maria. Appreciate you having me. Awesome. So Chris, tell us a little bit about your background, um, how you got into copy and how you became the world's, one of the world's highest paid copywriters, because I'm sure a lot of people listening are going to be very curious about that. Yeah. So I started, I was a public school teacher. Uh, I didn't like know what I wanted to do in school. Um, like when I was in college, I didn't really want to do anything. I, I was a wrestler. So I was like, oh, I'll just coach wrestling. So I became a teacher coach wrestling. And then as soon as I started teaching, I was like, yeah, this is not really for me. So back then, this was like 2013. I was like, there's people who make money on the internet somehow. I got to know what what they were doing, but like, there's something going on here. So I said, let me figure this whole thing out. So I kind of tumbled on the rabbit hole, started some blogs, didn't really get a lot of traction. Um, and eventually I found out about this thing called copywriting, where the way it was explained, it was like, hey, you just write words and then you hand people google document and they give you like thousands of dollars and i was like sign me up i was like i love writing i'll do that all day i was like i will spend any amount of time or money to figure out how to like do this magic you know like whatever this is so that's what i did i started for four years when i was a teacher i kind of slowly built up my copy business and i got to the point where i was making just about as much money writing copy on nights and weekends as i was in the day job um and at that point i i left the day job and i because i said to myself what could I do in my best 40 hours of the week rather than my worst 40 hours of the week? Right. Like, yeah. and ever since then, that was June 20, excuse me, June 16, 2017 is my last day teaching. Uh, so I'd already been writing for about four years and then just started climbing the ladder after that. Um, worked with a ton of clients in every industry imaginable. And here I am. Have you, were you mainly just freelancing the whole time or did you ever have like a, a like a copy job? I mean, I had retainers, you know, and I had some retainers that I was doing the workload of a full-time job, but okay. uh, like I told one client, I was like, you're going to give me four grand a month and I'm going to do every single thing you need. I'm not going to miss a deadline. I'll stay up till three in the morning if I have to do it. And I didn't miss one deadline um, for two and a half years. And I worked with them and I just, I, my output was probably more than most full-time writers. I mean, I'm, I'm, everyone has different gifts. I can write fast, you know, yeah. I could write good and write fast and just like what I'm good at. So I knew I had that output. I knew I could like crank and like get stuff done. So it was an advantage for me um, in those kinds, especially with short form stuff, emails, things like that. Um, I was just really well suited for that in terms of like personality, Okay. you know, whatever. So, I mean, obviously 2013 is a very different time than now for copy and copywriting became almost like a biz op, if I have to say, uh, you know, without cringing too much, but copywriting just became such a business opportunity where a lot of people were just like, hey, I'll teach you how to do copy, copywriting gurus and all that kind of stuff. Do you still think that with the advent of AI and just the flooding of how many people have gotten interested in, in copy, that it's still a very uh, lucrative um, position, I guess, or a way to make money. Yeah. I mean, so there's a few things like number one, I'm not really worried about AI. Um, I think we've seen the gradual degeneration of AI, <laughs> you know, like every week or every month, there seems to be another example of it just messing things up or just not performing or actually getting worse. Um, will that get fixed? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. You know, no one knows the future, but um, I'm not super worried about it. Um, just because like every time I've even used AI, like I use, I use AI every now and again, not to like write anything verbatim, but I'm like, oh, let me just generate some ideas. Let me start asking questions. What are some objections? What are some benefits? Blah, blah, blah. You know, just to kind of get my juices flowing. 
Um, but I've tried to have it like write stuff for me and it's quicker for me to just write it myself than to actually go through and edit the copy that I get back. Maybe not everyone's that way, but I'm that way. And I've had no slowdown in terms of client opportunities. And, um, if, you know, that's the thing, like maybe for certain things, it's good, but I'm not too worried about it in terms of copy being a biz op. Like, yeah, there's definitely been an explosion of that. Yeah. Um, you know, like it's hard to say because. Yeah, it's, there's definitely a lot of like hucksters out there, right? Who are just, they got three clients and now they're teaching everyone how to be a copywriter. Like there's definitely <laughs> people like that. I mean, I've seen them, you they know. have to ask people for like testimonials. They should have a lot of them if you're if you're it, getting into anything like that. Yeah, I mean, like I've worked with hundreds of clients. You know, I've had 5,000 students, people bought my books. Like I have, you know, some just like, hey, they're comparing me. And I'm like, hey, we'll take a look at my stuff and whatever, right? I don't care, you know. Um, but the thing is like being a biz op, like I know when I was a teacher, like I wanted that opportunity. So like, it's kind of, it's tough. Like there's definitely like a shady side, but there's also a legit side of like, if you want to do this career, like it is a, it is a career. I think it's kind of shifted a little bit where in my mind, the people who make the most money are the people who can go in and make growth happen. You know, like to just hand someone a Google document, like I kind of, you know, made a joke about that before, but like, yeah, you could still make money handing people Google documents with words, but like I don't do that with clients. I haven't done that in a very long time since I probably started. Like even from early on in my career, I was always like, well, what's the strategy? What are we trying to do? Like what what are the, you know, do we have to build this or build this? Like I got involved at a deeper level than just like, hey, go write this for us, right? Yeah. Um, so even now, like when I work with a client, I can sell them anything, you know. If I get you on the phone long enough, you're gonna give me money, right? Like I I'm not good. I can do that, you know. Well, I mean, 11 years, you know. Yeah. And and what it sounds like, though, like just to kind of clarify for everybody, like, and this is as a business owner, I've seen this transition as well, because I'm working with a lot of different people for for content writing and all this kind of stuff that we're doing is the people who who keep their jobs and, and kind of progress in companies and so forth. They're taking on a little bit of a marketing role, not just like, here's copy. Go ahead. Like, for example, I was do- trying to test it out a couple of years ago, email marketing. And, uh, you know, I, I had a couple of people test it out. And like one of them, like a couple of them actually all just sent me like series of emails, like email one, two, three. And I was like, as a business owner, like, I don't know how ESPs work. I don't know how to schedule that stuff or segment or any of that. Like, I'm like, you want me to hire you? Like you write the emails, but then figure out all that shit in the background that I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. So, you know, and then one person actually offered me said, I'm an expert in active campaign. Like I'll, I'll put it in there and segment your list. I'm like, done. There you yeah. go. I didn't even read their emails. I'm like, well, you know, that kind of takes, let's test it and see how that because works. Client, what I found is like clients want to buy an outcome. And how you get to that outcome, there's many different ways oftentimes to get to any specific outcome, right? So like when I work with people, I'm like, okay, so what do you want to do? Like, what are you trying to, what's the goal here? You know, what is it a specific campaign? Is it a specific KPI we're trying to hit? Because like I could, like I said, I could sell you anything. I could sell you, I could sell you hundred emails, you know, like, it does, but if it doesn't give you the outcome, it doesn't matter, right? So like, until I know what that outcome is. And what is going to be like a dream country solution for you? Sometimes it's sometimes it works out great because they're like, well, I just want to go from here to here. I'm like, oh, that's easy. We just need like this little thing right here, this little funnel, this little page, this little automation. Boom, we're done. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like that's the thing. And I've just learned this over the years working with so many people. But everyone in business is a capital allocator, or at least people who are successful. They take this mindset of like, I need to get this outcome. I want to allocate this capital to get this outcome. What is the likelihood that that's going to happen, right? So like when someone makes a hiring decision for any service, whether it's copy or anything else, like they need to think, okay, this is the outcome that I want. Like when I do my sales call, I'm just very clear, like, what's the outcome? Let's settle on the outcome and I'm going to tell you how we're going to get to the outcome, right? And then the package is the package. It's whatever it is to get you from A to B, right? Yeah. So that's always the way I think about it. And and I think that, that for a copywriter, like that's what you kind of have to think through. And it's hard a lot of times because when you're newer, you don't know because you're green. You are you just started, right? Yeah. What I tell people is I say, go get a job. Go get a copy job or go you know work half time, part time, whatever, for one consistent client where you can work with them for 12 to 18 months. No one ever wants to do that. Wants to, they want to live on the beach and bring the laptop and drink the mic. Laptop time lifestyle. Like, no. Laptop that lifestyle. Only happen, yeah, but that only happens. And and you know, anybody who's listening, especially the younger people that are getting started, is like, you know, we see these images and laptop lifestyle and all this. And it's fun also. It is fun to do that, like maybe in your 20s or when you're starting your career and stuff like that. But first 
first for me, at least, because I did live the laptop lifestyle for a while, it gets old. I'm like, yeah. okay, I just want to go home and I just want to have my stuff and I want my cup of coffee and my bed and all this. Like you just, you can't do that for too, too long. It gets tired. Some people can like, don't get me wrong, but I know a lot from experience. So I know a lot of people who I've worked with in the past that have done it for a year or two. And then they're like, well, now I live here and I like my life and I travel a couple of times a year when I need to. And that's it. Um, and then the other thing is, is that getting a job shouldn't be a taboo. Like it's not a failure, right? Like even if you're a content writer or or just anything that somebody's paying you to write, like do it. You know what I mean? And and that's how you can get like, you know, to be as a uh, as highly paid as Chris, because you, you didn't wake up and and you know, people throw money at you, right? It takes years of of perfecting your craft doing, and testing and so forth. I was doing long-term sales, I was for like 200 bucks at one point, you know, because I was like, <laughs> I don't care about the money. I was like, I just need the client. I just need the yeah. client and, and the result and the and then rent, it'll, yeah, it'll else. it'll it once it produces, then the next time you can say, well now it's two thousand dollars, right? So uh you know people pay for results as you say that's that's the most important the key thing here is people pay for results. So you need to, you know, if you're it, it, I think AI worries the writers who are doing the Google Docs, like you mentioned, right? If you're a Google Doc writer where it's like, here's something on Google Doc and you submit it, that's when AI can maybe, you know, soon replace you. I still think we're a little bit away, but I am a little bit more confident that AI is going to get a lot smarter. I think we're, you know, like it's kind of at the infancy stage now, but I think in a couple of years, um, you know, it's going to give some of the, especially the lower end uh, writers, like a, a run for their money, right? Like all the non-native English speakers that were kind of getting away with grammatical errors, they're done. Like they're done. Yeah. Like your English has to be like spot on, no errors, no like, you know, you have to speak. If you're writing for the American market, you have to speak like an American because the AI will be able to beat you if if you're not able to do it. So. Yeah. And it's also like discernment too and judgment of like – you might have 100 headlines, but you got to pick the one that you're going to put the ad spend behind. And like, that's something that like, usually it takes a human to be like, this is, you know, who's, someone's going to make the decision of what to run with. Right. And like yeah. AI can make their prediction, but you don't know. You don't, I mean, I do this all the time. When I run ads, I'll pick keywords, I'll do headlines. And like, we're going to put them out there. The data from the market is going to tell us what works. So like we could have our best guesses but until you you know make first contact with the enemy like you don't know how, how the battle is going to go down right so yeah. but that that's where the human element comes in and, and i agree with you but um you know the judgment the discernment the taste that people have that's what's gonna where the humans are going to really excel i think yeah Exactly. I mean, anything that you have to put a, a human touch on, right? Like, uh, you know, yeah, maybe it can write some good copy when you coach it and you teach it and so forth, because like it's an algorithm. But then who's going to decide which 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 is going to be the winning copy, which which is the best angle, which is, you know, you still need a human. So I am curious, just kind of you you mentioned that you're you know, we, we mentioned earlier that you're you're working a lot on X um, and I do find it, it's probably the platform that I hear the least amount of people use in terms of advertising, like Facebook's a big one. Instagram is pretty good for like very con commercial uh, consumer products and so forth. Uh, and we hear a lot less about X because to be honest, a lot of the X ads that I see are always you know, very focused on finance stuff like biz uh, crypto, that kind of stuff. Like, is there a world for X beyond those types of offers? And just tell me a little bit about, you know, how, what kind of offers work on X and maybe some strategies on uh, how to get an ad that, you know, converts well on X. Yeah. Um, I've seen just about every type of project product you can imagine. I've seen e-commerce, I've seen SaaS, I've seen a local gym here in New Jersey. I got targeted for ads for them. And they're probably about 20 minutes away. Um, so I've seen brick and mortar, there's, I've seen people selling canned peaches and beets. I've seen people selling uh, shirts, everything, you know what I mean? Like every kind of product you can imagine. Um, everyone obviously has a different experience. You know, no two news feeds look alike in terms of what you get. And it's based on a, on a lot of factors. Yeah. But the reason why you don't see a ton as much as like Instagram and everything else is just because it is so new. It's kind of like this untapped uh virgin forests essentially where there's people advertising there and they're doing really well some big brands some you know multiple nine figure brands eight figure brands obviously some billion dollar you know enterprise level companies and things like that but um it hasn't reached like the mass adoption phase where everyone's flooding in but there's a lot of people starting now um which is good i like that 
I like, yeah. you know, having having the whole room to myself, right? Like, <laughs> I'd rather be in that scenario. It's not always going to be like that, of course. You know, it might be 18 to 36 months where there's that window. But um, people are starting to wake up to the opportunity. Just because there's so much inventory out there, <clears throat> historically, it has always been like the – it hasn't been a good platform historically. But ever since Elon's gotten there, they've worked to really improve it. Partially because they they have to, right? They have to make it work. There's no other option for them. You know, like it's either going to work or their companies. They got to monetize unders. it, right? There's no, there's not. I mean, there is just uh, you know. On a side note, there is that you know the Twitter verification. I think you have to pay for that, right? Like, uh-huh. a, so so I'm wondering, do you think that they're still uh, banking on mon- monetization of ads, or maybe they went with that eight dollar strategy to try to ads? Ads definitely make up the lion's share still, and I think okay. it'll probably always be that way, just because there's so much more inventory for people who are going to spend on ads versus, you know, uh, check more profiles. But um, you know, there might be other, you know, they're, they're going to think about doing X payments. There's a lot of other different ways that they could get to the monetization. But I think ads will always be a part of it. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be bigger than than Facebook, right? Like, but it doesn't have to be. You know, it doesn't have to be bigger than YouTube. It could still work. You know, and this is the thing. Like, sometimes people are like, "Well, Facebook's so much bigger. It's two billion people." I'm like, "Yeah, it's two billion people." But like, if you're advertising in the U.S., like, how many people are in the U.S.? Like that number, there's about two billion people there. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. okay, so now the gap shortened a little bit, right? And like now it's maybe 50% bigger. So you were talking 90 million versus 140 million or whatever. So like, can you make 90 million customers work? Like, do you think you can, you know, is there, are there enough people? You know, it's not like there's yeah. a thousand people there. I like, mean, there's, there's 90 all- million, 90 million is still a considerable amount. I'm just wondering, like, from what I hear and and super anecdotal, but like people say they just can't get the X ads to work. They just, they can't monetize them properly. Um, so I'm wondering, do you have any like, is it really, is it industry specific? Like, do you see a lot? Like, I know you mentioned that you've seen a lot, but like, is monetization just easier for some types of businesses than others? And what are some tricks? Like, what what do you do on your day-to-day to kind of get an ad to convert well uh, on X? So, I mean, there's like, obviously the offer itself, there's the business itself and what it sells, but like on platform, there's the targeting which is super important in terms of like, who do you want to go after? You know, like for instance, I was looking under one of my clients, um, they they were running an ad and having horrible performance that I took a look under the hood and I was like, well, you know, like who is the, like, let's look at your customer data, right? And they were sending their ads out to everyone and it was skewing more like male, like younger male audience. So when we looked at their data, we found like 60% of their customers are like women over the age of 40. So I was like, okay, well, what if we just targeted like those, that demo, right? And yeah. like, forget about the other inventory and just go to where the biggest cluster of buyers are, right? So like that one thing, might make all the difference, right? So it's a lot like the targeting, like with Meta, just like broad targeting or lookalikes. So you're like, here's the ad, go find people. And like, they just do all these internal calculations. There is machine learning. There's a machine learning algorithm within X as well, but you also have more control of the targeting, which I kind of like. I'd rather have more control of the targeting, gender, age, location, language, operating device, desktop, mobile, all those different options, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, in terms of like making it work, I've seen everything work. Uh, one of the approaches that I like that I think works really well, I have a client doing this right now. There's this concept I think I created. I've never heard anyone say, but I call it the expertorial, which is kind of like the term advertorial, you know, where it's like traditionally it's a piece of content or a bridge page in between, you know, a batter ad and product page. Yeah. With X, you could t- make a long form post or a thread. And it's content heavy or it's story based. And it kind of preframes people and warms them up to want the product. And I've seen this work with SaaS. I've seen this work with digital products. Um, I haven't tested with e-commerce yet. I know it's going to work because it works on meta when we do long form ads. So I have no doubt in my mind it's going to work um, with e-commerce stuff, but it's worked with my stuff too, where essentially you just have, you know, a really insightful, engaging thread that doesn't look like an ad at all. Right. Um, you know, one that we're running right now for one of my clients, he sells a course, a course on how to start a newsletter business. And the course is, or excuse me, the t- the hook of the ad is, you know, how I went from a nobody to having a seven figure newsletter business. And he tells his whole origin story and gives some tips and content in 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 the you know expertorial itself. And you know, as you get to the end of it, it's about a thousand words. So you get to the end of it, it's like, by the way, you know, we actually have a full course on this. If you're interested, you know, click here to learn more. So instead of just doing a banner with like, we got a course on how to do a newsletter, like, cool, yeah, whatever, right? Like, ignore, you know. 
But when we lead with the content with that extratorial gang form style ad, that gets a ton of engagement and a ton of reach at a very low cost. It, it casts a wider net and people who get down to the end of it are pre-framed and they're ready to buy now. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is uh, what's old is new again, because the new the the new kid on the block is long form. It sounds like again, where for a while it was like, no, 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 only do short form stuff. And now, you know, we're kind of tricking platforms because you know, X is really like a short form platform. It's, you know, uh, we were talking about this earlier is a tweet. I still call it, but like whatever it's called now, um, you know, is supposed to be a, a very limited character. So now you're saying you're doing kind of an advertorial in there to inform people. And that obviously gets people to work uh, to, to want to buy. If somebody's reading kind of till the end, you're much more likely to convert than if somebody clicks on a, you know, 10 word ad, you know what I mean? Yeah is just not going to cut it. A lot of people are just going to X out and so forth. So I'm curious, you know, you mentioned, um, you mentioned earlier, just like X payments and so forth. Do you think like, what, what's your, you know, because you know, this platform so well, what do you think they're going to do with that? Do you think it's going to be like a, cause obviously Elon was involved PayPal and so forth. Do you think it's going to be like a, a peer to peer and how would that affect, you know, let's say, um, buying stuff from the platform? Um, I don't know, but I think if I could make a prediction, I think you're going to be able to have a credit card or maybe a crypto wallet or both, maybe multiple different options hooked up to the app. So it could be peer-to-peer -peer and it could also be, you know, they are competing with Substack and those other types of um, publications, right? And that's why they're actually promoting in the algorithm. Like if you have really good long-form stuff, that tends to get a bit more juice sometimes because they want some of those more insightful pieces on platform because they know that stuff works. So, but I think like, imagine if everyone knows the Amazon experience where you could one click buy stuff, right? Like yeah. what, what does that do if you're running an ad on X and someone could one click buy an item from the platform. I mean, I don't know if that's what they're planning. If if I was in charge of it, that's what I would be doing now, right? Like where, okay, you have X payments hooked up, like you could literally buy one click from, from the interface, you know? We'll see, we'll see if that's what they do. But like, if I had to bet my money, I'd say we're probably moving somewhat in that direction because why wouldn't they, right? Like, why wouldn't they make it frictionless? I'm I, I'm gonna pop in there as the payment expert here. I see chargebacks written all over that. <laughs> Um, just like whenever, like yeah, whenever you have maybe. a one click type opportunity, especially when it's like an ad click here, like I think that, uh, regulation and, uh, regulation might stifle whatever they're trying to do because yes, the ease like Apple pay for, I I'm, I'm thinking like when I, when I think about X as a payment, I think it's going to be kind of like an Apple pay type thing. Like you're going to have, you know, your X pay or whatever they want to call it. Um, and you will be able to kind of just like click and buy, but I think there's going to have to be some kind of middle layer between the ad and, you know, like right now, let's say at least on Facebook, I'm a little bit more familiar with Facebook is like, you go, you have to go onto a website and then you buy from there, um, to get, I, I can't imagine, for example, Facebook turning on where you could just click and buy directly on the ad, just cause I don't think the ad would have enough information for the customer to, you know, terms and conditions, all that you know, fun stuff there. Uh, but it is very interesting because, you know, Elon, uh, Elon Musk, like, you know, is, is PayPal is very near and dear to his success. So I, I just felt as soon as he bought X, I was like, there's, there's gotta be some kind of payment component. There's gotta be some, some, something there. It's going to be pretty exciting. And I think, um, I think there's just going to be a lot of kinks to work out on a compliance standpoint, but yeah. uh, I mean, I, I, you're probably very well positioned. Like if it does ever roll out, like you're already familiar with the platform in terms of ads. And I would say anybody that's, you know, uh, a marketer should learn because if he comes out with payments and they're able to kind of facilitate in app payments, it's like, it's going to be like a, a crazy, crazy conversion. You know what I mean? Like people can buy directly from there. It's pretty cool. Um, now, I, in terms of like, you know, just the, the niches that we mentioned, I just want to kind of dig in further. We have a lot of people who are listening who, you know, are in direct response niches, you know, uh, direct to consumer and so forth. Do you think that, um, you know, regular e-commerce and really like, you know, let's say supplements and, uh, eBooks and, and, you know, skincare, all that kind of, you know, c consumer products. How, how would you go about, uh, like strategizing, um, having a good converting ad on X with these types of products specifically? Um, I think the, the main thing is like, 
finding the right targeting. Um, it's like targeting and testing, right? It's like I use a, a fishing analogy. It's like first we got to make sure we're fishing in a stock pond, and then once we do, we want to throw a bunch of hooks in and see which ones are getting the bites, right? So the two targeting parameters that I like to operate a lot with are keywords and follower lookalikes. Um, there's some other ones. There's like events. There's like movies and TV shows, which like I don't ever really use that at all. But usually with follower lookalikes um, and keywords, we, we tend to find some pretty good audiences. You got to target your own followers. People have interacted with your tweets. If you want to do like more retargeting style stuff, which I think is super low hanging fruit, um, especially if you sell anything direct to consumer. You know, people hit your site. Boom. There you go. Right. Uh, it's, you know, very low hanging fruit. Um but once we have those targeting pools, then it's just a matter of testing formats. It's like if you have really good creative that you've run meta or other places that yeah. performs really well, a good ad is a good ad, right? It's probably going to perform well there too. Um, so you might not even need to necessarily create anything new if you have good performing creative already, whether it's a static, whether it's a video, whether it's UDC, whether it's an influencer, whether it's an ugly video, an ugly ad style, you know, um, whatever it is. Like I would just take my best performing pieces and start rolling it out and start finding different audiences, whether it's look follower lookalikes, whether it's you can do custom audiences too, if you want to um, target your own people, right? Or lists that you acquire some way, mm -hmm. or you could um, do the keywords, you know, because it's almost like Google PPC in that regard. It's like if people are interacting with a tweet or they're tweeting about something, you know, if they're tweeting about um, collagen, right? Like for example, yeah. and you use collagen as a keyword and you sell something that's a collagen supplement or something like that, then like, you know, okay, there's intent there, right? There's there's a match. So it gives you that control to kind of really get granular with it. Uh, then you can test out multiple different keywords and see which ones are actually performing. And then you just turn off the losers and scale the winners. So it sounds like what you're saying, it's really a game of targeting more so because I, I thought there was an actual different strategy in terms of like what kind of ads work on Facebook versus uh, X or, or whatever. So you're saying it's just you could take something that works well on Facebook and then uh, put it on X. From what I, I hear, again, I talk to marketers all the time, is X is a little bit of a, you know, um, a more contrarian type of market. Um, and uh, then, you know, maybe maybe a bit more conspiracy theorists, I guess. Not everybody. I'm on X2. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying everybody's, but just a little bit digs a little bit more deeper in facts, whereas Facebook is, you know, maybe more simpler. If we were to say Facebook is more blue, X is more red. You know what I mean? So I heard that the strategy actually has to be different a little bit for these things to to work. So what you're saying is forget that, take your best ad on Facebook, put it on X, but just learn targeting. I, I would so a couple of things. I would say number one, I would say as a first test, take your best performing assets because if they're good, that they're, then they're good, right? Okay. The second thing I would say is that the expertorial style where you're having more of that long form, where you're giving people those, they don't have to be conspiracies, but like you, when you think about you know awareness levels, like Eugene Swartz, right? Like he talks about the different levels of awareness. Like people on X might be a little bit in a lower awareness level for your specific product. So if you have a very good piece of story-based content or an advertorial style piece of content, that's usually a good entry point into the funnel. Um, so that would be the next thing that I would do. And then the other thing too, like with the audiences, I mean, everyone like, you know, that's what gets a lot of press, right? Like people write about like, oh my God, free speech or letting all these people say whatever. And like, <laughs> But there's assholes on every platform. You know what yeah. I mean? There's a lot of shitty people all over the place. I I run Facebook ads all the time. People say horrible <laughs> things to me. You know what I mean? Like say on Instagram, like whatever, I don't care. It doesn't stop me, you know? But yeah. I think with, I think what you see, like, are you familiar with like the IQ bell curve distribution, right? Like, yes. I think with, with Facebook, you got a lot of people, everyone in the middle, right? And everyone's like safe, controlled, like everything is, yes. you know, whatever. Because we had X, you got a lot more like knuckle draggers and just absolute <laughs> morons and psychos. But you also have literally the smartest people in the world hanging out there too. Yeah. So I think it's, and again, there's, there's, there's. There's everything in between, but yeah. Everything in between. Yeah. But like there's the, the level of conversation in certain circles on X, it's not happening anywhere else, right? Like when you have like VCs hopping in and like sharing investment strategies and and like that doesn't happen on Facebook, really. You know what I mean? Like it happens on X though. So like, yeah, there's a lot of idiots, but there's also a more higher concentration of geniuses too. So like you take the good with the bad, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, you know, everyone's experience is going to be different, but I just know that like a good ad is a good ad. X tutorials tend to work really well. 
um, targeting is super important. And it's just like, you know, with Facebook, some people run ads on Facebook and they say it doesn't work. I'm like, well, no, it didn't work for you because of whatever different factors. It takes a little bit of testing. It takes a little bit of time. Like, because if it was easy, everyone would just be a millionaire like that. You know what I mean? For sure. Do you find the ex tutorials get a lot of engagement uh, versus, let's say, video? Because I know on, on Facebook, you know, the videos do quite well in terms of getting engagement. I mean, good and bad engagement, but, you know, they get some. Uh, do you find a difference on X in terms of like video versus the ex tutorials that you're talking about? Yeah, the CPM is going to be higher in a video. But again, like it's OK, because if it's a good video, then it's doing a good job of demonstrating the product and you can have good results. Um, the expertorial stuff gets a ton of engagement, um, you know, four or five percent engagement rates. Oh, so wow. I think it's pretty good. Yeah, for 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 an ad, you know what I mean? Yeah. Especially. Um, and it just casts a super wide net. So like you're reaching so many new people also and you're doing it for very cheap. You know, we have one of my clients, this campaign is a 35 cent CPM. I've had like 38 cent CPMs. So like in terms of just casting a wide net and like getting some top of funnel discovery type stuff, it's really, really good in that regard too. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's different. It's not the same. You know, that's the thing. Like it's not the same type of platform. Okay. It's a lo- just like YouTube is not the same as, as Instagram or Facebook or Google sure. PPC is not the same, but like they all work. It's just, there's a little bit of nuance, you know? So in terms of, you know, me, if, if somebody's looking to say, let me break into X and let me try this, do you think that most media buyers or, or people who are, you know, just creating the ads and, and placing them on the different platforms, is it somebody who's really successful at Facebook likely will be successful? Like, how would you find somebody like you? I mean, obviously, we're going to have your contact information down below for anybody who wants to talk to Chris. But like, how how does a business owner find somebody who's going to be successful, for example, on X? Do they just people who are good at buying media, let's say on YouTube, would they automatically be good also on X? Hard to find people who are good on X because there's not a lot of people doing it. <laughs> I, um, I, and I only know this because when I started advertising there, I started looking around and, like I couldn't find anything, you know. So I'm sure that like the really, you know, the, uh, the McCann Erickson's and the Wyden Kennedy's and those, you know, super high level agencies, like they probably have people dedicated, right, for these kind of things. But if you're a small to medium sized business and you're not working with them, like it might just be a little bit tougher. Um, but again, like, I think it's one of those things where like, if you've gotten your business to a certain success on a different platform, assuming you've been paying attention to what's been going on, like advertising, you're like, yeah, there's some nuance, but it's not, it's not rocket science. You know what I mean? It's essentially yeah. list offer copy with specific parameters based on things that you've tested, turn this off, turn this on, include this, exclude that. Right. So it's, it's fairly contained in terms of the variables. I mean, you might have to test through some of them on the new platform, but like I said, I would, just, if it's a really good offer and you know, your audience is there um, and you can do searches, you know, you could search for topics. You can use the search bar. What are people saying about this topic? You do some social listening, see what the keyword volumes are, those kind of things. Um, if you do some of that and say, yeah, a lot of our people are here, or there's a lot of influencers in our space who we've done collabs with, but they hang out a lot of necks, you can just target those people, target their followers. So okay. I would say that that's a good way to start. Okay. So, I mean, it sounds like just basically using the same logic principles that you use on other platforms, right? So um, moving on, I know that you have a lot of experience also in email copywriting and email marketing and so forth. So um, there's been a lot of changes, you know, Google is is starting to like hand slap a lot of people for spam and, and all that fun stuff. So I'm just curious, you know, where do you see email marketing go in, in, you know, for now, it seems like it's, you know, from what I hear, especially for direct response and and these types of and business opportunities and, and digital products, email is still the cash cow. Like it, it just, it does well. So with all the restrictions coming up and so forth, where do you foresee, you know, email marketing go in the next year or so? Things are getting better um, because that's the thing that people don't like about emails when they get 100 cold pitches a week from people who are going to double your business 90 days or you don't pay a dime, you know, like you should or the gap. emails like that. If you ever sign up to the Gap email okay. list, you're going to get 17 emails a day about pants on sale. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, well, that's the thing. It's like a good email is a good email, right? So like I don't think, do you know, there's a reason they're sending that many because they know what their numbers are and – the game might have to change for them because if people are, if they have above like a 0.3% spam rate or whatever it is, then like, yeah, they're going to have to change their strategy. But like Howard Gossage is this, you know, Mad Men era uh, ad uh, advertising agency guy who I 
I like a lot of his stuff. His books are really powerful. He has this one quote where he said, people don't read ads. They read what interests them. Sometimes that's an ad, right? So like it kind of goes back into like the long-form copy, the expertorial, even with email. Like when we write emails, we write plain text and they're usually story-based or they're content-based and they lead people to the next step. So like they're interesting and engaging. It's not just like pair of jeans from the gap. 40% off. Yeah. Did you buy it yet? Did you buy it yet? Last chance. Wait, another last chance. Another last chance. Okay, we extend the sale. Last chance for the extension. You know, like, oh, yeah, that's going to be annoying, right? But, like, there's not a good ad, right? It's just yeah. you're carpet bombing your list, right? But if the ad is useful, like, there's, okay, for example, let's use the clothing example, right? So there's this guy on Twitter. His name is Manny. He runs this account called Well Built Style. And it's for, like, guys who want to, like, dress better, but, you know, not necessarily spend like a ton of money, not wear like Brunello, Cuccinelli, but like still like look good, be in shape and just upgrade their style. Really awesome stuff. His emails are amazing. And all the emails do is it's like, you know, how to get you know, the best jackets that you should wear for spring. And they'll walk through like the Harrington jacket, the denim jacket, and like how to pair this, blah, blah, blah. Right. And it's so educational, informative. And I'm like, if I was running the Gap or any other apparel company, that's what all my emails would be. Because yeah. cool, like jeans, T-shirt, sweater. Shoes, like, okay, like, what do I do with all that? You know, like, how do I put this together? How do I make this work? And like, people want to buy the outcome. They don't want to buy the product. The product is a vehicle to get to the outcome. So if you make your emails about the outcome, you're not going to have to worry about the 0.3% spam rate or whatever. Like, are you going to have complaints? You're going to subscribe. You're always going to have that no matter what you sell, right? But that's how you shift your email marketing strategy to be more interesting and engaging where it's actually useful content that people look forward to rather than like, oh, great, you're at 17 emails stay from the gap or whatever company, you know? So would you say like, I mean, every, every copywriter I ask that does email on a, a large scale, they have like a percentage of selling versus informative emails. Would you have like a good ratio for you? Like saying 80% of my emails should just be like good content and forming. And then I should sell on like 20%. Is there like a rule like that? I don't do any of those rules. I just okay. do. I just go on my gut. Um, it's kind of like... There's an ebb and a flow. You just feel it. I don't know. It's not the most actionable thing. But like, like when I'm like, well, I'm on my list. Like I try to do content. You know, the thing is like a good story will sell your product. So like, I don't think in terms of percent, like if it's like the last day for something, like, yeah, I'm going to send some last day reminders, but I don't do that every single day, right? Like most yeah. days, it's just, it's just usually like, is there a deadline or is it not? If it's not a deadline, I just keep on telling stories and educating and doing whatever. And if I have a deadline driven promo, then I'll, you know, set up the campaign within the parameters of the deadline. Okay. Um, and that's just always what I've done. But you're you're always in the safe zone if you're just like one email that I like to tell people to do is like behind the scenes of headquarters, like what's going on in the business. People love this stuff, right? Um, it's like, what are you building? What's coming next to the product pipeline? Like, what are you working on? What's interesting things happen? Did you get feedback from a customer? Did you go travel on a trip somewhere and like, you know, to meet a supplier? Like there's always something interesting going on in your business that you could just share with people. People will never get bored of that, right? And it's gonna sell your products too, because and by the way. If you need anything, here's some recommended products. Pop in a recommended product block, boom, they're in, right? Like okay. it's very, it's almost like a soft sell, it, but it leads, it gives people the power to make their own decision. Yeah. And oftentimes, like if they like you and like the brand and they like the products, like the outcome that they get from your products, they're just going to buy, you know? So I don't think in the percentages, you know? Okay. No, that makes sense. I mean, I like to to get different opinions. I'm wondering, so you said most of your your emails are text-based. Do you put links in there? Like like if you to buy something, do you ever include images? Like let's get a little bit into the technical stuff. Like I hear that images are not a good idea. I hear that too many links are not an idea. Like what where where do we like somebody new or where do they get these rules? Like how do they know what, you know, what to, to avoid getting spam or social promo. Yeah. If you do too many images, I don't know that there's probably a ratio within the, I haven't looked at this stuff in a while. Like there's softwares you can use to score your emails for deliverability. I haven't done that in a while. Usually like if I'm doing email to my list, I'll, I'll put in maybe an image of it makes, maybe it's a meme or a screenshot of something I saw or like picture from my vacation or like whatever, you know, uh, yeah. sometimes I'll do two or three, maybe four. But like I did one email one time where I had like 20 images and it destroyed the deliverability. I never did that again. Um, so I think 20 is too much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but you definitely don't do 20. But, um, you know, if it's two, three, four, five, like it's not a huge deal. But if you just have tons of images, then that's going to bog it down. Um, links. Yeah, you know, a handful of links. You know, you don't need 20 different links in there, right? If you have three, four, five, it's fine. It's like 10 links. It's like, okay, well, do you need 10 links? Is there you a know, tool you, like, like you don't have to necessarily like 
a shout out to a tool that you do like to use to check all this stuff, like in terms of deliverability? There's um yeah, there's a newsletter tester, I think is a free tool. Okay. And then uh, oh, so the other one that I used to use years ago, uh, I haven't used them in a while. Send Forensics, is that the one? Send Forensics was the one that I used that a lot earlier in my okay. career. Um, they were pretty good. You know, I know there's other ones. That, that, yeah. That's just the one that I had the most experience with. Um, okay. you well, know, you're the, you're the 100 plus, you know, million dollar copywriter. So, you know, those are, those are always, those are always good recommendations. So, um, I mean, in terms of email marketing and X advertising, um, you know, is there, is there one that you think, let's say I had a budget, you know, to, to, for my product, should I split it in two or should I go all in on one. What, what's your, what's your impression on that? Cause like people, businesses have limited budgets and that's, that's, you mm-hmm. know, a question that comes up, like, should I split it up over five platforms? Should I focus on one? Should, that's always a, a common question. So if you had a, you know, consulting with a client, like what would you advise in terms of like marketing budget? I mean, it's where, where you can get the best return on capital and also what the business needs. I mean, I think the easiest money is always in retention because it's always easier to monetize your existing database than it is to go out and pay to acquire new customers. But if you monetize your existing database more effectively, you'll generate the cash flow you need to pump in acquisitions. So it's hard to say as just a hypothetical, but I mean, I'm big on email just because it's easy money. Like I can make money appear in the next 30 minutes, you know, like if we need okay. to. Um, and I do that a lot with clients. I say, hey, want to see a magic trick? I say, yeah. It's relatively low cost also, right? To test. Yes. So that's why it's it's a good. So, I mean, I guess once you crush it on email, uh, that's when it's time to take some of that money and and maybe go on X or go on Facebook and so forth. Yeah, like customer funding growth. You know what I mean? Like generate the cash flow that you need and then pump in some of that in acquisition and you're going to acquire more customers and then future emails will be worth even more to you. So it's kind of like creates a flywheel effect. Okay, cool. So now, Chris, you've shared all this stuff and and I, you know, we've mentioned a few times, a hundred million plus copywriters. So tell us how you got that title. Um, and 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 you know, maybe your approach for 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 some some younger people or people newer in the industry on how to get to that level of success in copy. You gotta write a lot. You gotta write a lot. I mean, I I don't like people don't get the volume required, you know, um, it sounds like a lot, but I mean, I've worked with hundreds of clients. I have thousands of students who I've taken the work that I've done and systematized it and then turned that into templates and programs and formulas and frameworks that I've given to people who've taken them sometimes almost verbatim and ran them and, and made sales, you know? So, but like when I was coming up, you know, early on, like I was writing between 15 and 30 emails a week consistently every single week without fail with no breaks, no vacations. You know what I mean? And like people don't get it. Like they don't, <laughs> they're like, it takes me four hours to write an email. I'm like I wrote eight emails in that time. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they don't get the volume that it takes to get really good at something. And then this is true of anything. That's not just email. It's like, if you go to the gym, you want to look like a, a bodybuilder, you want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, like we well, can work out for 30 days and then, you know, like yeah. it's not mad. Like it's consistency. Work. It's, it's, consistency consistency and frequency and just continuing to improve one percent better each time so like i just i've written thousands and thousands and thousands of emails over the years i mean i've written tons of sales pages video scripts facebook ads x ads you know like all forms of short form copy postcards everything you know and like for me the way like i'm i don't know if i'm i mean i'm probably more naturally inclined to be a writer than maybe some other people but the talent doesn't mean anything unless you do the work, you know? So like you have to put in reps, you have to get opportunities with real projects. Like that was the big thing for me. Like one of my early clients, uh, I worked with John Asaraf from Neurogym and he was a really big name in the personal development space. And I wrote his, for 31 months, I was his copywriter. That was the client who, you know, I just said, give me everything you got. I will write every single thing you need. I will not miss a deadline. I will, uh, there's no limit to what you can give me. I'll write a hundred pieces of copy a month. I don't care. Can anybody still get that deal for 4k or is that, is that over Chris? (laughs) Yeah. You can get it for, for 25k maybe. Okay. 25. (laughs) We'll see. A little bit higher. (laughs) A little bit, a little bit. Inflation. It's inflation, you know? (laughs) Um, But that's the thing. Like I put in the work, you know, like I just kept writing and writing and shipping work and shipping work and, and like, other people, they'd say like, you know, they'd talk to a client, they'd say, well, 
the client wanted it for two hundred dollars less, so I said no because I'm sticking to my guns. I'm like, cool. Now it's two weeks before you get your next opportunity for a project. Maybe that closes two weeks from now. So in that month while you were sitting on your hands, I've written three funnels. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like, who's going to get better, right? Like, it's like a startup in the beginning. Startups are not necessarily, tech startups are not necessarily worried about monetization from day one. They're worried about acquiring users, acquiring a user base. And like, I took the same approach to myself. I said, I need to acquire a client base and a reputation in the industry. The money doesn't necessarily matter at the beginning. Because the money will come once I have the name and the recognition and the skills and the abilities and the confidence in myself to perform. And okay. so that's the approach that I took. And that's what worked. Okay, awesome. Well, so what it sounds like uh, for everybody listening is accept the work, especially at your, you know, if somebody's offering you work, you don't necessarily have to do it for free, but it might be cheap and it might keep you busy uh, until your next gig comes. And then, you know, obviously, uh, if you're working with business owners and 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 that are, you know, legit business owners, they, they can recognize good work and you can up your prices at that point, right? If if the work is good. So, uh, so Chris, when are you starting your coaching program? It sounds like you're you're ready to go with uh, with all this great advice do you have anything kind of in store like let's say there's some copywriters or people who want to learn from you do you have any because you mentioned you had some some documentation is there anything that you can share uh let's say with the audience or people who want to get in touch with you to learn from you specifically yeah um i have a book actually that's published uh it's called the moat and it kind of walks through my system for um growing brands it's a lot of marketing campaigns frameworks copywriting training things like that um you can get a free copy. Just pay shipping. Uh, I think I have a URL. I don't have a fancy, a clean URL. It's uh, okay. I could send it. But if you go, if you get on my email list, if you go to hundredyearbrand.co and sign up for my list there, um, you'll be on my list, and there'll be links to to grab it, and it'll be linked up on the site too. There'll be a well. Free, that's yeah. That, that that's a good that's a good offer because if if somebody joins your email list they could probably learn from you because they'll be reading your emails right uh, so that's always good um, and then obviously uh, thank you so much Chris for your time guys we're gonna have some contact information below if you're looking for help on your ex advertising because I know it's very difficult Chris is an expert so we'll have some details on how you can get in touch with Chris so you can start crushing X as a platform Chris thank you so much for your time we have so much actionable stuff uh, and everybody just please smash that like button share with everybody um in your list and let us know if you have any comments or feedback thank you so much thanks brian